My aim never made a mistake. Nagaland is a world apart. Nature in all her marvelous glory. Splendidly picturesque, vibrantly colorful, all lush and fertile. The land represents unimaginable natural beauty. The Nagas belong to the Indo-Mongoloid stock and besides Nagaland, also have considerable presence in Manipur and Assam. Nagaland offers rich traditional and cultural heritage. The distinctive character and identity of each of the 16 major tribes are clearly discernible. Strongly built, simple, honest and hardworking. The Nagas have a lifestyle that is both interesting and captivating. Surrounded by eye-catching hilltop villages, the picturesque town of Oka in the district of the same name is home to one such tribe, the Lothars. As with all other Naga tribes, the Lothas are also famous for their colorful dances and folk songs. This song thanks the gods for a good harvest and prays that the next harvest will be as good. The Nagas build their villages at altitudes between 1,000 to 2,000 meters. The choice of such strategic sites dates from the days of headhunting, when settlements had to be easily defensible against raiders. A glimpse of the traditional lifestyle, despite some obvious outside influences, can still be seen in the village. Stigmatized as headhunters, the Nagas were considered wild and uncivilized for a long time. Christianity came to Nagaland about 130 years ago and the society underwent a sea change. While Christianity brought spiritual solace and modernity to a society with the savage traditions, it also meant that much of the original culture was lost. Nagas wearing traditional dresses are a rare sight these days. One of the things that the Nagas have preserved is their tradition of hunting. It is an integral part of life for them. It's instinctive. Now, they hunt not for the prestige as it was in olden days, but to sustain themselves. But there are fewer animals these days, both due to overkill by the villagers and organized poaching. It's quite an occasion when an organized hunting party is going off for a hunt. The villagers gather to bid them good luck and hope for their safe return. The hunters prepare their guns and collect necessities to be consumed during the hunt. The Nagas are apt craftsmen and they use homemade muzzle loaders and .22 bolt action rifles. 
Factory-made 12-bore single and double-barrel rifles are also used. The spent cartridges are filled up and used again. Early in the morning, the party leaves for the hunt. But a breakdown on the way means catching a lift on a border road's truck. The hunting party is already late because of the breakdown, and they need to cover time fast. They have reached 70 kilometers from their village and still have some way to go. Tired and exhausted, the hunting party reaches village Hanku. The last motorable road ends here. From here on, it's a long trek on foot. But with sundown approaching, it is suggested that the party camp here for the night. The party makes most of the remaining light by cleaning and checking rifles and taking hot shots. <laughs> Chem Bemo and Chobatang explain the elaborate process of loading an ancient Belgian-made cap-lock muzzle-loading gun. A wad of cotton is put inside the muzzle to block the hole on the other side, and the required amount of gunpowder is poured, followed by the pellets. Another wad of cotton is used to jam them tight. A small amount of gunpowder is put through the detonation funnel and the detonation cap is put to rest on it. The rifle is now ready to be fired. At the break of dawn the next day, the hunting party makes way for the base camp, 15 kilometers downhill. On the way, Zubon spies deer tracks. He says it just went by. Meanwhile, Thang Demo keeps putting traps. This trap is camouflaged with banana leaves. It's a ring trap for small animals, such as squirrels and small cats. Thang Demo knows the jungle like the back of his hand. He's got a sharp eye and understands every little sound and signal that does not mean anything to the layman. Suddenly, he rushes into the undergrowth to find edible mushrooms that grow on rotten logs and collects them for dinner. The hunting party now reaches an orange plantation on the lower range of Hanku village. They have to cross it and go to the other side. They rest for a while in a rest house inside the plantation built by the villagers for travelers. The hunters have a drink of water stored in the hollow of the bamboo. Before leaving, the bamboos are refilled for the next traveler who comes here. Thang Demo rechecks his gun license. He doesn't want to be caught without it. The hunting party crosses one of the many tributaries of the river Doyang. They notice fresh pug marks of two wild cats on the riverbed. Since time immemorial, a hunt has been serious business for the Nagas. It has meant survival for them. What they take away from the hunt is to be consumed by them and their families. It has always been a need-based thing rather than greed. Though banned, dynamite fishing is practiced by the Nagas. The process of preparing the explosive needs a lot of expertise. Depending on the depth of the river, the dynamite is cut and it is waterproof by wrapping layers of newspaper and plastic sheets and is further tied by green bamboo splits. A fuse is then attached to the explosive and it is further waterproof with more plastic. Finally, a stone is attached for weight and the detonation cap is fixed to the fuse wire. 
The explosive is now ready and Thang Demo lights the fuse and throws it in. The catch is about 20 fishes, but at a great cost. The gradual appearance of the fauna in these rivers is something that concerns us all. Pollution is poisoning the marine environment gradually. A solution to the problem, in addition to the enforcement of the law, would be an education campaign in this remote region. While the men are busy in the hunt, the women back at the village are occupied with daily chores. It's a tough life for most women. A simple thing like fetching drinking water means a trek of about five kilometers. Most of the women are expert weavers, and they regularly weave the traditional colorful shawls, scarves, and bags. Naga handloom products are well known. Patterns on the shawls differ for men and women. Also, a man of position will wear a rather different shawl. The Nagas use vegetable dyes to color the threads, and a well-woven shawl can easily last a lifetime. Selling these handloom products is also a much needed means of livelihood for most households. Back on the hunt, Chembemo spies a movement in the undergrowth and goes to check it out. This is a spangled drongo. It's a juvenile bird. It is still common in Nagaland, but very rare in the rest of India. <laughs> Next morning, Thang Demo is making a trap for the birds and squirrels. Because of ease and twisting, only raw green bamboo is used in making the trap. He demonstrates how it works. The trap is camouflaged and the hunters move on. Meanwhile, Chobatang is busy nearby. This is another spangled drongo. Later on in the day, Thang Demo goes to check the traps. There is an orange bellied Himalayan squirrel caught in the trap. <laughs> The hunters need to check the traps regularly. This is the bronze drongo. 
It's a rare bird. I do this one. I mean, the hado. I do be a wildcat. No, you don't Zuban Thang has caught a pied falconet. It's the smallest bird of prey and can kill a bird double its size. These are the black crested bulbuls. Nagaland abounds in flora and fauna. It is endowed with species that have been reported extinct in other areas. Not too long ago, it was possible to see at close quarters animals and birds in their natural surroundings. But now, all that has changed. A prime example is the hornbill, a bird that is all but extinct now because of constant and relentless poaching and killing in the name of tradition. Thang Demo and his party were hoping to kill wild boar, civets and deer. But the numbers of these animals have dwindled over the years. There is a reason for this. Commercially organized hunting has wrecked havoc with the natural balance in the jungle. The poachers supply all kinds of animals, big and small, to the local markets. Though banned, the barking deer is hunted and fetches a price of rupees 6,000 in the market. Other rare animals such as wild hogs, bamboo rats, college pheasants and civets can also be found easily here. Strict implementation of the hunting laws and limiting the hunting season to less than the present four months can help in curbing the relentless poaching. When the hunting party returns, the village gathers to welcome them. The fact that they didn't kill any deer or wild boar is quickly forgotten in celebration of their safe return. This also marks the end of the hunting season. The Naga tribes are generally full of folklore. Music is an integral part of life for the Nagas. This song is sung by a young girl about her stepmother, who troubles her a lot and makes her work like a servant. The young girl longs for her own mother. An overwhelming majority of Nagas practice slash and burn cultivation on the hill slopes. A part of the jungle is cleared and the felled trees and cut undergrowth are left to dry for several weeks and then set on fire. The land is cultivated over a two-year period and then lies fallow for several years. 
allowing new jungle to grow up. The last few decades have brought a sea change among the Nagas. A string of educational institutes and hospitals have been built, and state transport vehicles connect remote villages to the towns. But political peace still eludes the region. Nagaland is a hotbed of insurgent activity and ethnic clashes. Its search for a political identity has led to continuous unrest and violence across the state. What all this has meant for the young people of the state is that there are few opportunities in their own land for them. Most young people are disheartened and demoralized. Oh, my God.